Hey everybody, John Mark here. Welcome to Mark My Words. A huge welcome to my tens of thousands of new subscribers. This video is going to be my introduction for you to the winning right to introduce you to how you can be a part of the grassroots right wing winning, ensuring that you are not part of the losing right, but instead that you understand what we must do to win. Before we get into it, I want to make sure you know my website is johnmarksays.com. That's the home base for everything that I do in addition to YouTube. If you are fairly new to me and fairly new to The Winning Right, the first thing I recommend you do is watch my playlist called The Winning Right. Start by watching through this video right here and then go through the rest of that playlist. The link is in the description of this video and that will give you a great foundation of how to be a member of The Winning Right. So huge welcome to all of you. You. It's great to have you on board. Let's get right into it. What is the winning right and how can you ensure that you are part of the winning right instead of part of the losing right? Well, there are two criteria that you have to meet to be part of the winning right. The first one is you have to understand that America and Western civilization cannot survive continued influx of non-white immigrants into our nation, legally or illegally. And this is not because they're all bad or something. It's because they vote 70% left wing. They vote 70% Democrat. And the right wing is politically suicidal when they favor legal immigration. The psychology that causes these folks to vote Democrat is too powerful. And we cannot hack past it in large enough numbers to turn the tide. So this is why my message in almost every one of my videos is the grassroots right wing must hold land against non-white immigration if we are to survive politically. Now, Trump is the last Republican president just because of immigration, whether he wins in 2020 or not. So what's going to happen after that is once the broader grassroots right understands that they will never win any national level elections again, there's going to be major secession movements and or a second revolutionary slash civil war. I have other videos going into that in detail. And if you look at it in detail, you will realize the grassroots grassroots right wing is extremely likely to win in that scenario. Whether the grassroots right ends up ruling unopposed over significant portions of the United States of America's landmass or all of it, we have to be ready with something better than we had before because what we had before obviously did not work, at least not fully. There were some deadly weaknesses in what we were trying to do before that allowed the left to get such an upper hand on us politically to where we're not going to be able to win any more elections after Trump. So that leads me into the second criteria that you must meet in order to be part of the winning right. The first one is you must oppose all non-white immigration because we simply cannot afford to have people coming in and voting 70% left. That is the first test you must pass to be part of the winning right. The second test you must pass is you must reject failed strategies. There is a short list of strategies that you see on your screen that the right wing and Western civilization in America have been trying to implement. These are failed strategies, not always because they're completely wrong, but because they at least have one or more fatal flaws. So you see the list on your screen. I'm going to go through them briefly so you understand why each of these are failed strategies. And I have more detailed videos on most of these so that you can understand. And I'll tell you what those are. Folks, I don't want my descendants and your descendants to have to go through this whole mess again. There is no reason they have to go through this mess again. All we have to do is learn from our mistakes. Western civilization has done so many fantastic, great things. We just fell behind in the 20th century and early 21st century because we tried these failed and incomplete strategies. We must reject them. In order to be part of the winning right, you must reject these strategies because otherwise you are just a loser, even if you have good intentions. Folks, good intentions are not good enough. We must understand how to win. And at the risk of sounding prideful, I know how to win. The people that I am involved with, we know how to win. We know how to abandon these failed strategies. We know how to explain it to you so that you can understand it. It's not really rocket science. It's basically just casting aside nice sounding lies that we wish were true but are not. So briefly, let me go through this list. 
Number one, civic nationalism. That's what I was just talking about. Civic nationalism favors mass legal immigration of non-white people. We simply cannot afford that. The reason is, is that these non-white folks, not all of them, but most of them, unfortunately, operate in a psychology that we cannot hack past. And so you can watch my video that you see on the screen there, Why the Left Never Learns Part 1, if you want to understand in detail why it is so hard to hack past the psychology that most of these non-white people are operating in. And it's very understandable if you put yourself in their shoes, but that doesn't mean it's good, and that doesn't mean it's good for us and for the way we want to live. So civic nationalism is the first failed strategy we must abandon. Now that doesn't necessarily mean we have to have a pure lily white nation with only white people in it, but it does mean we cannot have mass non-white immigration into our nation and there has to be a limited number of non-whites because white people vote majority right wing in every single election. And so if you want to have a right wing nation where you can feel safe and secure living in a right wing way, this is just a necessity. So you have to understand the psychology of most of these non-whites that come in and realize that we just cannot accommodate that psychology if we want to survive. The second failed strategy. This could basically just fall under the category of tolerance, but you could break it down into two ideologies, I guess you could call them. Classical liberalism and libertarianism. The fatal flaw in both of these ways of thinking and both of these strategies is that they show too much tolerance. What they're trying to do is show tolerance to anything that doesn't matter directly to economic productivity. In other words, we don't care if you're gay, we don't care if you're this, we don't care if you're that. As long as you participate in the economy, we're happy. The problem with that is that people care about a lot more things than just money. I care about being able to send my child to a school where they're not going to hear LGBT propaganda when they're in third grade. I care about that actually a lot more than money in many ways. So the problem with these strategies is they do not take into account the full suite of things that people care about. And thus when you show tolerance to people that are intolerant, like the LGBT crowd, they will punish you in a heartbeat if you cross them and they go out of their way to punish you. What happens is they start imposing costs on us and imposing costs on us and imposing costs on us. And sure, the economy may be going gangbusters, but we don't just care about the economy. So tolerance is a mistake. To understand more about this, you need to watch my video, The Number One Law of Political Power, which is intolerance. The most intolerant group always wins. If you are not willing and able to punish that which you do not want, you do not have power and you will be walked all over by people who do whatever the heck they want to you. Classical liberalism has no power. It's being swept aside all over the Western world in favor of either far leftism and then the reaction to all of that, which is the winning right. Classical liberalism is not sustainable in the long term. It contains the seeds of its own destruction for the reason I just shared. It allows people to impose costs on things that we value very, very much, and then we react against that, and our system of rule of law is allowing classical liberalism, is tolerant of all this instead of shutting it down, and therefore you end up with a situation like we have in America where we're on the brink of civil war. And I don't know the exact timing of the civil war, but it doesn't take a genius to see that that's where we're headed. Another failed strategy that's related to classical liberalism and libertarianism, and that is what I call pure individualism. Classical liberalism and libertarianism, and even many right-wingers kind of believe in this pure individualism thing. The reason that doesn't work, the reason it's hard to enforce that and keep your society healthy without breaking down into the situation we have right now, is that most people on this planet are not interested in pure individualism. They're not interested in just earning what they as an individual can earn out of life by their own merits. The reason billions of people are not interested in that is because that's not the optimum strategy for them as an individual. Why? Because they don't have much ability. The average IQ on this planet is about 90. Folks, 90 IQ people and below, we're getting to the point in the modern economy where they cannot add much value in a modern economy. 
The smart people of the world have basically left them behind. I mean, yeah, you can have some of those people, but huge numbers of those people really cannot get much out of life on their own merits. So what do they do? They latch on to a strategy that is better for them, at least in the short term, which is they form a gang with other people, people who are outcasts, people who don't add much value, people who impose costs on society. You have a coalition of the fringes and of the weak and of the less able. And please understand, I'm not demonizing these people. I completely understand why they're doing what they're doing. And you need to understand it too. So they form a gang, they form a group, and they lobby for political power as a group. And they say, more successful people owe us something. And this is why it's impossible for us to teach them in any major way. Yes, some people learn, but millions and millions of these people are never going to learn because what we would try to teach them is not the optimum strategy for them. If you need to rewind what I just said for about two minutes and play it 20 times over again until you understand it, do so because this is absolutely vital. And this brings us to another failed strategy that we've had, which is trying to teach the left. Now, yes, we should get our message out there, and yes, we should teach, but we cannot rely on that as our primary strategy. The grassroots right wing has been trying to rely on that as our primary strategy. If we can just teach these people, if they'll just understand, I'm here to tell you folks, the vast majority of them are never going to understand. Now, maybe some white people will continue to turn to the right wing as they get tired of being demonized by the non-white people. You do see some of that dynamic. And people do turn more right wing on average as they get older. But it's not enough to turn the tide, especially when we have mass immigration of people who vote 70% left. So we cannot rely on teaching the left as a primary strategy that is going to enable us to win because they do not want to learn because it is not the optimum short-term strategy for them. And I explain more about that in my videos, Why the Left Never Learns, Parts 1 and 2. It's a two-part series. So pure individualism is a failed strategy too because a pure individual does not have any power against groups who gang together to lobby politically and steal stuff from the individual through political power. So the grassroots right wing is learning that we have to be a group of our own that defends our stuff from parasites because otherwise these people who are parasites are going to gang up on us and defeat us unless we act as a group in our own interests. Pure individualism is a failed strategy because it is too weak. Pure individualism and classical liberalism and this kind of stuff, libertarianism, would only sort of work in a situation like we used to have in America where it's 90% white or more. Because white people of Western European descent, that's kind of their instinct. But most people on this planet, including even many white people, that is not their instinct and we cannot teach them that instinct because they accurately perceive that it is not the best strategy for them to get the most they can out of life. The best strategy for them is to form a gang and be parasites as a gang. So we have to have our own gang that says, no, you're not going to be parasites on us. And if you try it, we will punish you. The last failed strategy I will mention here is full franchise democracy without reciprocal limits. Now that sounds like a little complicated phrase, but if you just understand what I said in the last couple of minutes, you understand why this is a bad idea. Full franchise democracy means everybody gets a vote. The bum on the street gets the same amount of vote as a person who's a hard worker who has three kids to feed, who doesn't want to be a parasite. Parasites get the same vote as a non-parasite. You see the problem with full franchise democracy where everybody gets a vote because it just so happens that there's more people on this planet, especially when you have mass immigration, that want to just form gangs and be parasites than people who want to succeed on their own merits. So if you unleash democracy where everybody gets a vote, it's exactly what the founding fathers predicted. They said, if you give everybody a vote, you're going to have everybody just voting free stuff from the productive people. That's a paraphrase, but they predicted that. That's why they did not give everyone a vote. You say, this is kind of messing with my head. This is a little bit different than what I was taught. I was taught that democracy is good. Yeah, I'm here to tell you that unless democracy has some severe limits on it, democracy sucks. It's the slow road to socialism and communism, which is exactly what we are seeing in America today. 
full franchise democracy without reciprocal limits is unsustainable, just like all these other failed strategies. And we need to learn this. Now, we can have a system with some representation, where people have representation. We just have to have some common sense limits on who gets to vote, and there's a variety of ways that we could do that, and or we can have some legal limits on the type of legislation that can be passed so that the legislation is not parasitic. And there is a fairly simple way to do that to ensure that our rule of law does not allow parasitism. Our rule of law in Western civilization in America is relatively fantastic compared to most of the rest of the world, but it currently has flaws. We need to plug those holes. And one of the holes we need to plug is to ensure that representatives of the people are not allowed to pass parasitic legislation. And it can be done. There is a way to write that into law and set up the system fairly simply so that this whole corruption factory that our legislature and system of government has become is nipped in the bud. Yet people can still have some representation because the only other option is to have a king or a strong man. And you could say there's pros and cons to that, but that's going to be hard to sell to the broader grassroots right for one thing. And then, of course, there's weaknesses to it. What if you have a great king and then his son is an idiot? So why not just do what Western civilization and America have done so well, which is continuously improving rule of law that punishes parasitism. Why don't we just do it better? All that happened is we fell behind in the 20th century because we got blindsided by certain leftist strategies. We can just make it better. And that leads us to the final piece of information I want to give to you about the winning right in this video to set you on the path to being a productive member of the winning right. If we really want to be the winning right, we cannot just say, okay, we're not going to make those mistakes again that we made previously. We have to do something else instead. We have to have a better strategy to replace the old failed strategies. And that's what propertarianism gives us. You'll hear me talk a lot about propertarianism. It's a fantastic solution that will work, that will sell, and that gives us something we desperately, desperately need, which is a solution that plugs the holes in what we were doing before and fixes the mistakes so that our descendants don't have to go through this whole thing again. Because it would be such a tragedy to go through a civil war, revolutionary war scenario and come out the end of it and then our descendants just have to go through the same garbage again a few decades down the road. We cannot let that happen. So we have to have something better. That something better is propertarianism. What is propertarianism? Well, every time I try to describe propertarianism, I feel like I'm not doing it justice, so I'm going to do my best. The way I would describe it is it's a set of insights that gives us three valuable things. Number one, it gives us a better understanding of why Western civilization has been so uniquely successful. It helps us understand all of the key ingredients in the secret sauce of Western civilization. That's very important because one thing that all of these failed strategies have in common is they take for granted certain secret sauce ingredients in Western civilization and fail to defend them because they take them for granted. So I'm going to do a video on this in the future, laying out the secrets of Western civilization success. And I'm going to talk about it with Kurt Doolittle, the founder of Propertarianism, when I interview him on my channel as well. Kurt Doolittle is the founder of Propertarianism. He's a very successful individual. He's a tech entrepreneur that built tech companies and sold them. This is not some fly-by-night guy. He's been working on this for many years. We've got a lot of momentum going with this because when grassroots right-wingers hear this, it's like giving candy to a baby. They're like, ooh, I love this. So the first thing Propertarianism gives us is it helps us understand all of the ingredients in Western civilization's success. When we define those ingredients, we can then defend them. Part of the problem with American Western civilization is a lot of the things that white people of Western European descent do, we do by instinct. Propertarianism takes our instincts and puts it down on paper and turns it into empirical observation and science. That's the second thing that Propertarianism does for us. It takes the typical right-wing moral language or instinctive language and turns it into scientific language, empirical language. And the reason that's so important is because once you have it in scientific, empirical language, you can then turn it into legal language. So that we have the ability through our system of rule of law to defend our civilization and defend our nation and defend that which we value from the parasites. 
And yeah, you could just have a bunch of random laws that you make and say, no, you can't do this, no, you can't do that, no, you can't do the other. But it's easier just to use a system. And propertarianism gives us that system of rule of law. It's kind of like a Pac-Man. If you guys remember the old video game Pac-Man, where this little guy with a big mouth would just go around and chomp on things. Propertarianism is like a Pac-Man bot in our rule of law and our legal system that seeks out and destroys any attempt at parasitism and chomps on it. Chomp which is more effective and efficient than just trying to make up random laws to cover every possible instance of parasitism that the left could ever invent and that the parasitic elites could ever invent. So propertarianism takes right-wing instincts and puts it into scientific language so we can then put it into legal language. I'll give you a quick example, examples help. Take the LGBT crowd. A Christian right-winger's reaction to the LGBT thing is, that's a sin. Okay, well that works fine for people who believe in the Bible, but what about people who don't believe in the Bible? They're gonna say, well, it's a sin, says who? Says the Bible? I don't believe in the Bible, so that doesn't work on me. And then we have many non-Christian right-wingers as well. And they might say, well, this whole LGBT thing, it's just icky. It's disgusting. We know from the science that conservatives have a greater disgust response to things like this, and that disgust response is basically a civilizational protection mechanism. But still, if you just say, well, that disgusts me, how do you turn that into law? How do you turn that into rule of law without just having willy-nilly arbitrary, I don't like this? So what propertarianism does is it says, okay, the actual reason that right-wingers do not want the LGBT thing running rampant is not just, quote-unquote, it's a sin, or not just, quote-unquote, it's disgusting, but let's talk about this empirically, scientifically. What's actually happening is that right-wingers are instinctively perceiving that the LGBT crowd is imposing a cost on our civilization. So, for example, I have a Facebook friend that graduated from high school a couple years ago. He said, a few years ago, there was not a single kid in my high school that was into this whole transgender thing and gender fluidity and all of this stuff. There was not a single person in my high school that was into that. I go back a few years later and now there are dozens of kids that are into this. That's because they're being propagandized. And, you know, kids are just sponges and they're looking for a way to stand out and have an identity. And they don't know the consequences of this. And now you see the LGBT crowd trying to say that it's okay to teach grade school kids about this and sexualize grade school kids. And of course, they were always going to do that because that's their whole thing. If you watch my video on why the left never learns part one, you will understand that. They just want to not be looked down on by society. But there's a reason they've been looked down on by society for thousands and thousands of years. And that reason is empirically that they impose a cost on our genes. They impose a cost on the ability for an individual person and their family, an individual man and woman who have children, to persist their genes through the generations. I want my genes to persist through the generations. It's something that I value. And our civilization needs our genes to persist through the generations. So what's actually going on is the conservatives, the right-wingers, are having this instinct, but that instinct can actually be expressed in empirical language. What's happening is the LGBT are committing a property violation. They are damaging and putting at risk a certain form of property that we value immensely. It could be argued it's our most important form of property, which is our genes. Now, of course, we're not going to convince the left with this. The point is not to convince or persuade the left. I already told you that's not a winning strategy. A winning strategy is we write this in our rule of law so that we can have empirical and scientific language that says, yes, this is a form of property that people value, and therefore we can punish people when they try to violate or harm or put at risk that form of valuable property. So if you want to be an LGBT person that stays in the closet and does whatever you want in your bedroom, that's one thing. If you want to come out and try to affect our children, that's a completely different thing. That's a property violation. And if you want to do that, you can go live somewhere else. Because if you do it here, you're going to get put in jail. And we don't have to have an attitude of we're demonizing the LGBT crowd. It's just simply, no, we are not going to allow this property violation. So that's just one small example. If you want to learn more about propertarianism, I would recommend starting with my video, Propertarian Policies, because that's something every grassroots right-winger is going to be able to relate to. If you want to understand more about it, you can watch my video, Parasite Proof Government, Intro to Propertarianism. That will give you the basic outline of the logic of it and how we can improve our rule of law. So that's the second thing that propertarianism does for us, is it takes 
right-wing instincts, the civilization building and civilization protecting instincts that have made Western civilization what it is, and it takes it from instinctive language and turns it into empirical scientific language so that we can then turn it into legal language and protect our property. Because the problem we're having right now in America and Western civilization, folks, is the grassroots right wing does not have any legal means to protect all of these forms of property that we value very much that aren't just physical items that cost money. Propertarianism enables us to put our civilization building, civilization protecting right wing instincts into law so that we have legal recourse instead of letting all of these grievances build up and then there's a civil war. This is so important. Finally, the third extremely valuable thing that propertarianism provides to us, and this is extremely practical and we need this and we need it now is a constitution that plugs the holes that were in the original constitution so that when the grassroots right wing comes out on top at the end of some kind of a conflict scenario, we have something better to put in place. And please understand, I am not even criticizing the original constitution. It was what the founding fathers knew back then. However, they would have never dreamed of many of the things that the left has done. They would never dream that somebody would think up the idea of importing tens of millions from all these other non-European nations. That would have been the furthest thing from their mind. They would have never dreamed of what's happening with the LGBT crowd and all of the social justice warrior aspect. If you think about it, folks, Karl Marx was not even born when the first constitution was written. There's no way the Founding Fathers could have known enough to plug all of these holes. And some people say, well, going back to the original Constitution would be a huge improvement. Of course it would be a huge improvement. But we had the original Constitution and look where we are. So propertarianism has a constitution that builds on and honors the original constitution and the intent of the original constitution and makes it more airtight. It makes it more clear. So to give a simple example, one of the problems we have right now is with leftist activist judges. The reason we have that problem is that the original constitution does not lay out that the judiciary must follow a certain logic of jurisprudence. Our original constitution does not make that clear enough, and so that opens the door for these leftist activist judges to interpret things however they want to do whatever they want to do. So the propertarian constitution makes it extremely clear the logic that judges must use. And the logic they must use is, in a word, reciprocity. They cannot allow anything that violates reciprocity. And there's a very specific definition of reciprocity. Any violation of reciprocity is parasitism. So propertarianism institutes one law to rule them all. And that law is reciprocity. No parasitism on any form of valuable personal, group, or civilizational property. And it makes the logic very clear so that then if a judge is violating that logic, that jurisprudence, we then have grounds to go in and very clearly say, you have violated this, therefore we are going to impeach you as a judge. That is something that our original constitution does not provide. That's just one example. So please understand, I am not slamming the original constitution. It's just that it was written 200 years ago before Karl Marx was even born. And so propertarianism gives us an upgrade to the constitution. If you want to go read the constitution on the propertarianism.com website, you can. The one thing I will say is my goal is not really to sell all the ins and outs of the legal language and all of this to the broader grassroots right because it's basically like a judge lawyer type thing. I mean, judges and lawyers are high IQ people. They're professionally trained people. So trying to analyze the ins and outs of propertarianism, if you're inclined to do that, if you're interested in that, go for it. Absolutely. We need people who understand it. We need people who can implement that. And of course, a lot of the constitution, the average person is going to be able to understand because it's made up of policies that are the logical outcome of this one law to rule them all, which is reciprocity. And that is the right-wing instinct in a nutshell, reciprocity. We do not want violations of reciprocity because that imposes costs on us. Many millions of people on this planet want to violate reciprocity. They want to steal using fancy words as an excuse. And we have to have rule of law that does not allow them to do that. And propertarianism gives us that. And if you go read the policies or watch my video, Propertarian Policies, you are going to love the policies that come out of that. But it's also important to understand it's not just a list of policies. There is a legal language and a logic in the legal language that Propertarianism puts into the Constitution 
And there are some simple but extremely powerful changes in the way the government would be structured to limit the ability for government officials to engage in parasitism and limit the ability for our parasitic elites to engage in parasitism and limit the ability for the left to engage in parasitism. So understand that, yes, it's a list of fantastic policies that basically every grassroots right-winger is going to love, but it's not just a list of policies. It puts some improvements into our rule of law and our system of government that protect against us getting to the point where we're at here in America, where the left wing is on the verge of total permanent political victory unless there's some kind of a war or separation secession movement. Propertarianism gives us these improvements so that our descendants do not have to fight this battle again. So those are the three benefits of propertarianism. A better understanding of all of the ingredients in the secret sauce of Western civilization's unique success. It takes right-wing instincts that up till now in Western civilization's history have basically just been instincts that we kind of do, and it puts it into scientific empirical language so that we can then put it into legal language. And then it gives us something very practical, which is an upgraded constitution that honors and builds on the original constitution and carries out its intent with our new level of knowledge that we have 200 years later. Dear listener, if you are a member of the grassroots right wing and you have a basic understanding of the things that I've explained to you today, maybe you go in and you watch a few more of my videos. It's a time investment, but it's absolutely worth it because it will ensure that you are a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. Because again, good intentions are not enough. We've had good intentions all along for the entire 20th century, and we have lost and lost and lost and lost. Good intentions are not enough. We must know how to win. We must be members of the winning right, not the losing right. If you have a basic understanding of what I'd share today, maybe you go watch some more of my videos. If you're interested, you go read some of the writings on propertarianism.com. You go read some of the writings on my website to help you understand how to be a member of the winning right. We know how to win. We just need to spread the knowledge of how to win because people like us are the people who need to be leading when this whole thing shakes out because we cannot go back to these failed strategies. That would be a tragedy of epic proportions. Let's not have a tragedy, folks. Let's have a victory parade. Let's make it so that our descendants do not have to fight this battle again. I love you all. Make sure you are subscribed because you're not going to want to miss any of my videos that I have coming up. All the best. Till next time. How much longer do we want to play trench warfare with the left? How many more times are we going to have to fight this battle? You know what my answer is? Zero. Zero more times. This is going to be the last time. And if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will.